Level Design From the implied dungeons and ruins of Zork, the single-screen battlefields of Space Invaders, the self-contained obstacle courses of Super Mario, the winding underground caverns of Metroid, the intertwining overworld and dungeons of The Legend of Zelda, the linear pathways of The Prince of Persia, the expansive open worlds of Grand Theft Auto, the simulation-driven puzzle boxes of Deus Ex, to the infinitudes of the cosmos in No Man's Sky. We've come a long way, but what have we learned? Do we have anything resembling a history of this evolution? Indie game dev and level designer Robert Yang has, in this talk at GDC, and in his blog posts over the years, spoken about this subject at length. There are a lot of tools that game designers can use in order to elicit the emotions they want from their players. Narrative, art aesthetic, soundtracks, are some of the ones that jump to mind. And no doubt, these are powerful tools. However, I am of the opinion that how you shape the space the player inhabits, as well as how you enable them to traverse it, can play a more fundamental role in affecting their experience than any other affordance that might be laid on top of it. What this episode of The Ludonauts Journey is going to explore is how to look beyond the layers of smoke and mirrors that the developers place on top of the level, and understand the purpose of the space that the player traverses, the fundamental need within the game's design that it accommodates, and the consequences on the play experience as a result. In this video, I'll be relying on a lot of game design nomenclature that I've talked about in previous videos, in particular the idea of states and constraints, and how they manifest when applied to level design. All of these ideas build upon the foundations laid by Brian Upton in his phenomenal book, The Aesthetic of Play. Go watch my video about it if you haven't already. Or, you know, don't. I'm not the boss of you. Video game levels are elaborate constructions that mimic the properties of space and time. When you boil away a game engine to its fundamental constructs, what you get is a tool built to engage the sensibilities for a time in the exploration of virtual spaces and abstract concepts, whether it be on part of the designer or the player. The paramount consideration to my mind is how the player will experience the level as it progresses. As the player moves from point to point in the level, carrying out their objectives and accruing new ones, they will constantly encounter new instances of what Brian Upton calls a crux a mismatch between their desired state of the game and the game as it exists currently, that brings with it the possibility of failure to achieve your goals. This can manifest in any number of ways, and it prompts the player to act upon their intentions, to reshape their circumstances until they align with their desires. I spent some time looking at the kind of games I play, which tend to be single-player system-driven games that give the player a variety of tools in order to achieve their goals. I also appreciate a good narrative where I can find it. What follows is a list of what I think are common patterns that more or less every game that matches the description I just gave borrows from to varying degrees in their level design. Think of the level as a collection of separate states, where each position that the player could be counts as a new state. In this pattern, the access to new states is dependent directly on how the actions of the player interact with the levels and the elements embedded within it. There is skill involved in transitioning between states, as there are active elements of the level that might change in the process, creating uncertainty in the player and forcing them to make decisions. These are the types of levels I personally find most engaging and the most interesting to talk about, as they involve a direct feedback between the gameplay and the level, though a good game takes more than just this. Here the actions of the player contribute not to a direct transition to a new state, but instead act as incremental progress towards reaching a state where the player can access a new part of the level. These usually depend entirely on external constraints and systems not related to the level space itself, though successfully completing these challenges might require the player to have an understanding of the space as well. Lots of MMOs, open world, and action or FPS games tend to use this type of structure as it makes a lot of sense when you factor in mechanics like combat systems that allow you to create challenges that boil down to kill X number of enemies to progress. Seen most plainly in genres like adventure games, the purpose of this style of design is less to engage you with the space that the player traverses, but rather to emphasize the narrative and aesthetic affordances laid on top, like art and sound, as the player moves from state to state. This isn't restricted to adventure games though, as almost every game at some point requires you to pick up a key that is a quest item that unlocks a door somewhere else in the world. Here the constraints have less to do with systemic aspects of the game, but rather are drawn based on the circumstances dictated by the narrative. This pattern is appropriate for engaging the player in ways that have less to do with mechanical complexity, or when you want to provide some padding in between moments of high intensity. 
seen in games like Minecraft and Don't Starve. Here the level exists less as a space to be traversed, even though the player might do so in order to reach their objective, but rather a toolbox which enables player action. The need to harvest resources act as the constraints that define the player experience. They serve both as stepping stone and canvas, allowing for the player to invent new objectives for themselves on the fly, based on what they see in front of them. Thus, the states here are defined entirely by the player's goals. This allows for the player to achieve things that the designer could have never predicted, given a robust enough toolbox. So we've identified these patterns. So what? What do we do with this information? To find out, let's put these patterns to the test. Say I set out to make a game where the primary emphasis of the mechanics was to impart a sense of flow and smoothness, and this could be towards multiple ends, either employed in a game like Mirror's Edge, where you are an agile parkour person, or in a first-person shooter like Doom, where you're an unstoppable badass, and I wanted to create a level in order to complement this choice. What kind of level do I make? If you're thinking about flow, one way to express it might be about making the play experience about navigating obstacles that don't provide much of a challenge when considered individually, and hence, don't hold much consequence. Jumping over an individual pit in Mirror's Edge isn't that challenging, but when put together, provide the challenge to the player of completing all the necessary actions in the most efficient way. In other words, using failure as the goad to poke the player towards doing things the right way. Another way to interpret flow might be as Journey did, where, except in some situations towards the end of the game, the player cannot really die or lose progress in any significant way, but the challenge of chaining together a sequence of actions is still maintained as the primary game loop. Here, failure is much less taxing on the player, but the game feel remains the same. Instead of relying on a precise sequence of actions to convey the feeling of flow as you traverse the level, here, the act of traversal often takes place on its own with much of the player's time spent gliding, sliding, and soaring through the air. Flow manifests here as mechanical convenience while you soak in the gorgeous sights and sounds around you. And yet another way might be as the Shadow of Mordor games did, where the Assassin's Creed style parkour system that allows you to effortlessly move from place to place as you slaughter the orcs enforces the fantasy of Talion as a badass vengeful spirit, with a level offering you various perches and opportunities to come at your enemies from at any angle you choose giving you the freedom to drift from option to option as you move in between enemies. Here's the level design patterns I think each game incorporates towards achieving its ends. It always blows my mind how many different ways there are to express certain abstract concepts in game mechanics, and it is my hope that by boiling it down to some simple basic patterns that can be used as starting places to guide the design of a level, it becomes possible to design with intention just as the player would navigate the spaces you create.